Welcome, Susan. It is such an honor and privilege to have you with us today. Thank you, Christina. You are welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. I love teaching, and I've been teaching mental health uh, uh, licensed clinicians since 2005, so this is my, my favorite thing to do other than trauma therapy. Um, I want to start out by explaining a, a few terms. Um, your audience may or may not be familiar with the term medical intuitive. That is a clairvoyant skill that I think other people can learn. I don't necessarily think it's gifting. I think it's a heightened um, awareness of intuition that everybody has. And I have been able to funnel it into um, doing readings, which is um, allowing me to get to the root causes on different levels of consciousness with uh, clients. So it, it is a, um, a very handy skill, and our presentation today about metaphor diagnosis is going to bring in everyone's innate intuition and fine-tune it into the skill of reading energy, which is um, engaging metaphor language or symbolic sight, similar to dream interpretation to be able to listen between the lines when you're talking to a client uh, and you're, you're getting history from them or you're having them talk about their, their um, issues or, or traumas or phobias or panic, whatever it might be, they will give you very direct clues that need interpretation. They may or may not, in most cases, they won't understand what they're actually saying to you until you feed it back to them. And I'll give you some examples and case histories from my practice that will illustrate that so that you can get this, this skill. This metaphor for language and metaphor diagnosis is uh, one part of the edit process. And the edit process started to evolve out of my, um, my trauma work and work with combat veterans back in 2005 or so. And I was teaching. Uh, clinicians and they were saying, well, we're not intuitive like you. We can't figure this out. And I said, well, there's got to be a manual mode way to do this. So using the chakra system, which is um, chakras are energy centers in the body and, uh, and the mind, they uh, correspond to different areas of the body. And using that as a base, the uh, uh, edit process has sort of evolved into this art and course diagnosis because I want you to get this and um, start thinking about clients now that have difficult to diagnose issues or you can working and you can't get the root of it, the healing or they're getting worse or you're just stuck. And the metaphor uh, language handout, which if you have that, um, pull it out, that should be able to give you some clues as to what's going on. It's particularly important when you have issues of uh, dissociation because if your client can't tell you what is the issue or what is the root of it or you say to them, well, what or who does this remind you of? And they don't know, but they're just stuck in panic. Well, then where do you go with that? Uncued panic attacks send, the last time I checked the statistics, about 200,000 people a year to the emergency rooms because it feels like a heart attack. Panic attack feels like you're going to die. And so they run to the emergency room, sometimes over and over and over, which costs us all a lot of money. And they get diagnosed with panic, given some pills and sent home, and nobody ever gets to the root of the problem. So panic and phobias are particularly, uh, it's particularly helpful to use metaphor language with panic and phobias, as well as childhood trauma and issues. So. Um, According to the DSM, there are three characteristic types of panic attacks. Unexpected, which is uncued. Situationally bound, which are cued. And um, situationally predisposed. So for example, if someone has um, a phobia of driving because they've had a previous car accident, that's pretty cut and dry. But if they have years and years of panic disorder, and uh, have done everything and been everywhere to try to get over it and they can't get over it, you have to go deeper. One of the things uh, that everybody should know about is the ACE study. The ACE study stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. That study is a landmark study that was done, I think, in like 1998. 
in conjunction with Kaiser Hospital in San Diego and the Centers for Disease Control. The ACE study came about because the Kaiser had a very successful program at the time with helping people lose weight. They um, had their complete history. They were already patients in the wellness program. So they, they put them through this weight loss program. They lost a lot of weight, 40, 50, 80 pounds. And then they would quit the program and go, go, go gain the weight back. The doctor that was in charge of Letty, he got They need to be big or it's of all kinds of childhood trauma. That's not that doesn't come from me. That comes from Judith Herman, the psychiatrist at the Boston Trauma Center, who wrote my favorite book on trauma, Trauma and Recovery, which I would recommend all of you to um, look at if you're going to be getting into a lot of trauma uh, treatment. Trauma and Recovery by Judith Herman. So anyway, we know that the etiology of trauma is helplessness and overwhelm. You're never more helpless as when you're a helpless kid, small child, baby, infant. And getting into these other aspects of consciousness that I touched on earlier, when you're going digging around for the root of something that you have no idea, neither does your client have any idea, you're looking at aspects of consciousness that with trauma that the hard of um, an army officer uh, uh, all kinds of uh, antidepressant or uh, anti-anxiety meds he'd been to therapy he just couldn't get over it so he came to me and And I um, I on him because I asked him if he had an repetitive dream and the core relation and then in those dreams. So the dream seems or uh, that sounds a lot like your birth like he says, I don't know. I said, call your mother. So he looked at his watch, thinking, I'm paying for this probably, but I said, just trust me, you know, is your mother alive? Yeah, call her. So the mother says, well, um, listen, I would in so I said, all righty then, uh, the edit covering the dissociated, which in this case, baby self, we were able to clear by healing what had happened to him in the birth and um, I'll bring him into bring his baby self into present time using guided imagery. So the 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 issue, the takeaway for this is the the metaphor of being trapped in the small spaces by interpreting the dreams and um, talking to him about the birth 
and uh, he became symptom free uh, in that one session. So the other things about um, metaphors that you want to explore are um, repetitive dreams, um, ideations. I said to him, what are your ideations when you have a panic attack? And he says, I'm dying, I'm suffocating, and the whole world is dying. So keeping in mind that panic attacks feel like you're dying and doing the heart attack thing and all that, he was imprinted with a, uh, a die, I'm dying message. There was a threat to his life. So he's also in this complete helpless and overwhelmed preverbal baby, and his mother's body is being assaulted with stress hormones, and that's going to him. There's no food. He's not eating for three days, and neither is she. She's probably wondering if she's going to die. She might be figuring she wished she was dead by the end of the three days. He's thinking he's going to die. I mean, the whole energetic imprint of this is just overwhelming. So um, I can't tell you about any double-blind uh, studies that have to do with proving what I just said, but cause and effect is what it is in your practice. So if somebody heals, um, you know, we all win. So again, your first step is to investigate prior episodes of life-threatening events or the perception of a life-threatening event. That word perception is very important because a child, a small child, is not going to have the ego strength to determine that just because mom and dad are fighting, that doesn't mean that he's or she is not in danger. So the things that happen to kids and how they, how they imprint them and how they um, store them is very different, of course, from adults. Um, in fact, I think it was last Sunday um, on CBS This Morning, Mary Steenburgen, the actress, was being interviewed, and they were talking about her upbringing and her father was uh, sick. He had a lot of heart issues. So she said to the interviewer, I thought that if I was really good and if I was perfect and I got all A's, my dad wouldn't get sick. And then when he did get sick, I thought it was my fault. That is classic for how a child perceives the events around them. So you have to keep that in mind, that their perception has to do with survival and safety uh, and attachment, and that's going to cause a lot of trauma and problems uh, later on in their life if that isn't handled. So. Uh, you want to look at the repetitive dreams, their ideations, what they say, what they think, and also an affinity for or an avoidance of certain times in history, themes in movies and books. So for example, um, a child that has been abandoned either emotionally or physically in, in childhood might tear up and be overly emotional when they hear about um, a lost dog or something or a missing child. It's going, to go, it's going to light up the circuit in them that has imprinted that in their own, in their own experience. So look for that um, when you take a history and then you ask them what type of activities, places, times in histories, books and movies, themes really speak to you and which ones don't you like? Because both aspects of that information is equally valuable. The avoidance is probably even more, especially in panic disorder. So um, I'm going to give you another example of using metaphor language to diagnose a phobia of flying. This client was a female. She was in her mid-30s, and she said she had this flying phobia, and I was wrong thing to think well, this this guy had to be a anybody of this but we're lying so here's the when when you are in a 
molest situation, one that you trust, um, you're being held down, so the physical imprint would be correlating to maybe being held down by the seatbelt. You are out of control when you're on the plane, the pilot has control. Um, you're trapped and you can't escape, same thing. So when she would go to approach the flying experience, her body-mind would go into overdrive. It's like, oh no, I don't want anything to do with this, and she would get the panic. But it had nothing to do with being on a plane. So that's one of the detective work parts of this metaphor diagnosis is that what you're seeing in present time has energetic clues, imprints, a, a hidden outline under the radar. That's what you have to clue into in order to diagnose this because your client does not know. She thought it was silly what I was saying and I said, well, just you know, give me a minute. Let's just heal this thing that happened when you were seven and we'll just see what happens. So we did two sessions on the sexual abuse and cleared that and two weeks later she got on a plane and did not need her Xanax and was fine. And it, the other thing is that when using the the method of healing, which is um, it, with both of these people, it was um, a, one of the energy psychology um, methods. The field is called energy psychology. You can learn more about that at our professional association, which is uh, energypsych.org energypsych.org under resources. We've got probably by now approaching 55 to 60 published journal articles and studies on the efficacy and the safety of things like uh, emotional freedom technique, which is uh, acupressure tapping while you put your attention on the problem or the pain in, in some cases if it's a physical manifestation. So the acupressure tapping, it's like acupuncture without the needles. You just tap on their emotional release points on the face and hands and the issue goes away. Um, there's a video on my website. It's about 12 minutes long on the home page. And it's a uh, Iraq veteran that I treated in 2004. He had witnessed a murder-suicide when he was 10 years old that triggered him into PTSD from Iraq at age 20. He was a corpsman and had done the whole tour, seeing blood and guts and everything for the whole tour. He was fine. And then in the final week, he was called to deal with the aftermath of a suicide. A Marine killed himself in a port -John. Now, He didn't witness it, but the fact that it was a suicide and the previous thing at 10, it lit up that circuit. And within 30 days, he had every DSM symptom of PTSD, I think, except one. And it happened to be that his supervisor was my neighbor across the street. So he knew the whole history of what this guy had been through and how he was unwinding. He says, we've done everything. We've given him pills. He's been to the counselor. He's getting worse. You know, and can you do anything? And at the time, I was still new, but I said, well, you know, bring him in. So I, when I realized what had happened at 10, I said to him, this is the root of the problem. I know you came here for Iraq, but we're going to do this first. So the video shows the... About, we did about 10 or 12 rounds of tapping, and this is about the middle. So we, you know, I don't want to cause anybody pain. So the, 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 it's, it's easy, well maybe it's not easy, but it, there's ways to treat trauma without uh, flooding. So we use the onion approach. We started at the outer part of what would be the, what would be the name of this, this um, murder-suicide if it was, if it was um, a movie. And he just said, the wrong. So we started tapping on the wrong. By the time we got to five or six rounds, it was low enough on a zero to 10 uh, intensity scale to um, actually treat it. And he, I said, we're just going to tap and talk. Tell me what happened. And that's what's on the video. So the, um, the circuitry of having to, wit having to deal with the aftermath of a suicide that he didn't even see uh, brought up the episode from age 10. And then we did two more sessions on Iraq stuff and cleared the sights and the sounds and the smells of blood, men screaming, all kinds of things. So the energy psychology techniques are the techniques that I and my colleagues in the association use to treat um, all, these, all these types of issues. So um, I wanted to open up for any questions right now about just general metaphors or can they hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Hear me. Does anybody have any questions about metaphor diagnosis? I don't hear anything.
We're having technical difficulties. Stand by if you're trying to speak to me because I can't hear you. <laughs> See why I didn't want to do this at my house? <laughs> I feel the same way. Ronnie, are you there? I hope they've been able to hear me the entire time. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was just asking the audience if they had any questions and we didn't hear anything. So either nobody has anything to say or they can't hear me. Which is it? We're not sure. All right, well, I'm just going to go on. Maybe we'll be able to solve that in a little bit. The other, um, case study. the other case study that I want to talk about is um, a man that came in. He was in his mid-60s. He had severe psoriasis that was not responding to any type of psychotherapy, medication, topical creams. He'd been to therapists, a psychiatrist. He'd been everywhere and uh, the dermatologist and nothing would take care of this. So we were able to do some EFT tapping on some of his issues from childhood. He grew up in uh, an alcoholic home. Both parents were alcoholics. They were brutal. They beat him and his siblings with belts. The father was a blackout. It was just trauma from the day he was born until the end. And it went away to probably 80 or 90 percent, and he was happy with that. So a year later, he comes back, he shows up, and he says, if you can't help me get over this psoriasis, which is by now all over his body, he said he was going to kill himself because he couldn't stand the itching. So he had not allowed me to take him into the deepest parts of the rage and the grief in the previous session a year ago. So I said, let me, let me see the sores. He pulled up his shirt, and I said, those look like angry, weeping sores. They were red. There was fluid coming out of some of them, I, and I read the energy of those sores, angry, weeping sores. This is where we have to go. Are you ready now? And he finally gave in and said, okay. But he had been trying to protect himself from the pain of going deeply into those memories, but that's what the body needed to uh, release. So the body-mind speaks to us in metaphor language. So read the energy, look at things symbolically and metaphorically, and you'll be able to... Um, solve a lot of things that, you, that um, people have gone through uh, multiple uh, issues of trying to solve uh, their issues and their problems. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the um, dissociated ego states and the rescue recovery of that. It's, in my experience, it's a combination of almost like a shamanic journey in the shamanic tradition, like soul retrieval, they call it. Or if you want to look at it from a spiritual standpoint, part of their spirit is not in present time. It's a, it's a form of dissociation. But it's a part of themselves that is split off or dissociated. So for example, if you see someone that is throwing tantrums and they're an adult, you're actually dealing with a child because adults aren't supposed to throw tantrums. I mean, there's rageaholics, but you know a tantrum when you see it. The demanding type of behavior that little kids do, you know, if you've been around little kids or you have one of your own, you'll notice this. And so it, what it tells you is that there's an age, a younger age of them or ages of them that are showing up, trying to get attention, trying to get healing and that need to be treated. So normally, especially when you're working with trauma, the person you have in front of you is not the only person that you're dealing with. There's invisible pieces that are needing, uh, needing attention, needing diagnosis, needing care and treatment. And if those parts or pieces are not addressed and brought into present time, you're going to get an incomplete or uh, cure or treatment or it's going to come back or, or something like that. It's not going to be able to be resolved in um, the function that you're doing at the time. So if you're doing cognitive behavioral and you're talking to your adult client, 
but there's an underlying little child or children that were wondering why um, mommy or daddy didn't like them. Um, and that if that isn't addressed on a child's level, you're not going to be able to resolve or release what is going on in the adult. And in terms of weight loss or addictions or hoarding, it, the metaphors are written all over those things. Why do, we, why do we think that Oprah, with all of her resources and money and treatment, cannot get over her weight issue? I mean, I don't even think she's trying anymore, but when she was trying for years and years, she was never able to be successful. And she's been very open about her sexual abuse issues and her abandonment by her mother. And it certainly wasn't safe to be small if you were Oprah. And there's dissociated parts of her, I can see, that have never been brought into present time. One of the, the reasons why I believe that, aside from just experience of you know, seeing this so many times, is several years ago, probably over 10 years ago now, she did a TV special about nine-year-old girls. She called it Nine. Now, why would Oprah be wanting to do a TV special about nine-year-old girls? Um, another client of mine was a very successful medical professional, and he quit his practice to become a martial arts instructor for 12-year-old boys. And I said to him, well, that's a very laudable goal, but why would you give up a six-figure income to do this? And he had talked to me previously about having been molested. And I said, do you realize that you've now dedicated your life's works to making sure that other 12-year-old boys have the ability to defend themselves because you can't or you couldn't? And connected that dot for him. And he put his hands over his face and started to cry because he was being driven by this need under the radar, but he never connected the dot. So this metaphor language is connecting dots it's reading the energy, it's finding the correlation, the common denominator between two things that are seemingly unrelated. I guess if you want a definition, that's the definition I would give, is finding the correlation or the common denominator between two situations or things that are seemingly unrelated, like flying and sexual abuse. So when you engage metaphor language, you are reading energy, basically. So let's go back to this rescue recovery of dissociated ego states. And I'm not sure how many of you have ever thought about um, the birth trauma or the womb trauma or, or going even further back um, into past lives. And there certainly aren't any studies on that, but I'm going to go there because I have seen a number of clients that have done everything and been everywhere, and the issue was not able to be healed until we went into a past life. So, having stuck my neck out now on tape, I may as well, <laughs> I may as well continue. So I'm going to give you some case histories as soon as I can get to the right slide here. We talked about threats to survival um, and panic, okay, threats, always look at threats to survival because if you're treating something upstream of survival, you're going to get an incomplete res a resolution and or you're going to fall into the survival hole. So what are, the, what are the issues around survival that we need to deal with? The five main emotional wounds. I would suggest that you write these down. The first one is abandonment. If a child is young enough, um, abandonment imprints as death or a very strong threat to survival. Kids know they need their parents, they need the protection, the food, the roof over their head, and if the parents are freaking out, they will do everything they can to prop up the parents, and then you have codependency. So abandonment, the next one is betrayal, um, humiliation. Humiliation and shame are very close, and that imprints into the uh, identity of a person, and it corrupts their personal power as well as their identity. So the bullying that's going on in schools, the leaders and the followers, leaders that are natural born leaders, and some kids are, can be perverted into bullying by witnessing domestic violence or having parents bully them because then they imprint 
power with that type of, um, of uh, negative um, manifestation. Whereas a follower would be more like a, uh, a kid that's a little more on the shy side. And um, they are going to be imprinting any type of bullying or um, violence in the home as well as all kids do. They make it about them. You know, if they loved me, then dad wouldn't be hitting mom. Well, we know that's not true, but that's what they think. So there's, um, they feel betrayed by the parents because um, they must not be enough, they decide. Or that, or that wouldn't be happening. Um, so, uh, yeah, abandonment, be, uh, humiliation, betrayal, injustice. Injustice is a big one. If you have an adult that starts talking to you about things not being fair, because that's what kids say, oh, that's not fair. And if you don't give them justice, whether it's over the one kid getting the bigger piece of pie than the other, you're never going to hear the end of it. So just give, them, give it to them. Um, but if your adult client is talking to you about something not being fair, you're talking to a, a child part, and you need to go deeper into that child part. Well, what what is what does not being fair remind you of? You want to ask that question. Write this down. What or who did this remind you of? Then you're taking them into metaphor language with you, because they're going to have to go into another memory or a metaphorical connection to the presenting problem by telling you what it reminds them or who it reminds them of. Well, it was the time the nuns embarrassed me at the blackboard because I didn't know the arithmetic. Or the teacher said, this is the worst poem I ever read. Or the parent that says, um, well, if you got a B, why can't you get an A? You know, these are all damaging things, especially when they've been repeated over a period of time. But Adults don't recognize that, unfortunately. Um, so what are the abandonment, betrayal, humiliation, injustice, and rejection? Rejection is the last one. Rejection, criticism. Unfortunately, there's in some family lines, they believe that the way that you raise a good child is whip them into shape, metaphorically or actually, especially in the South where I used to practice. People were beaten with everything and just bloody sometimes because that's the way we do it. And then they would say to me, well, I thought everybody was raised by that. I didn't know that was trauma. You know, while well, I'm trying not to cry listening to this. So um, rejection and criticism, shaming, um, even they don't even, they don't even uh, train animals that way. But that's how some people try to raise their children. Um, never a kind word, never um, any support or encouragement, just punishment and judgment when you don't do it right. Well, you're going to raise somebody that's going to be very emotionally damaged if you do that, mm -hmm. which some bullies are, and that's why they strike out to people. So here's some, some things that I always tell my clients. The problem is not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. So whenever you're dealing with a person that's been through a lot of childhood trauma, especially, there's a lot of embarrassment and shame about that. They they feel like they should be over it by now, that should word. Um, why is this happening to me? You know, they're, they're in a lot of pain. And so I always try to kind of normalize and balance it. I tell them, I deal with this all the time. A lot of people, this happens to a lot of people. You're not the only one. You know, I've been here and done that. We know how to get out of this. You know, we're just going to handle it. It's no big deal. It's, this is, it's in the books. Um, so it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. Um, relieves them of some of the shame and embarrassment. And then the uh, what or who does this remind you of question will take them into um, the answers, or if they don't have any answers, engage your metaphor diagnosis in your symbolic site and look for the correlation. This um, Trace the Energetic Signature page they can see these slides, right? Yes. Okay. Is um, I don't have time to go through all of them. I've told you about the psoriasis guy and the fear of phobia. This army major female thought that she had a snake phobia. And as we began to look at the energetic signatures of the snake phobia, well, what is it about snakes that you don't like? Oh, they can hide in trees. They can get you in the night. They, they can sneak up on you without any sound morphed into her fear of being raped by troops. 
So I sensed it pretty quickly, but I just kept giving her uh, the opportunity to tell me more about the snakes, what's afraid of them, what or who does this remind you about snakes? And um, so phobias of snakes and spiders, um, closed places, can sometimes relate to um, sexual abuse in very surprising ways. Another person that I had a woman was terrified of spiders. I mean, the neighbors could hear her screaming if there was a spider in the house. Everybody was upset. There was just it was like oh, taking over her life. It's, again, it was beyond reason. So that ended up to be, um, we looked at the energetic signatures of the, of the, the spiders. Um, similar to the snakes, uh, you never know where one might be, you know, they hide in corners. The root of her phobia of spiders was um, a sleepover at a girlfriend's house and they were all in sleeping bags on the floor in the living room and the older brother took the opportunity to come down in the middle of the night and sexually molest her while the others were sleeping. So when we cleared that, the phobia of spiders went away, as what happened with um, uh, the army major from uh, Afghanistan. So let's talk about past lives. I, I gave a little bit of uh, uh, hint to that before. I, I have a law enforcement background and I am very linear and I used to write for an automotive magazine about um, smog checks. So I'm not really that, that <laughs> my, my assistant here is laughing. Um, I'm, I'm really pretty grounded, but I got to tell you, when this kind of hit me in the head, I just said, okay, well, you know what, let's just go there. So this businessman comes to me with this hoarding problem. He brought photographs, piles of boxes of papers, books, covered every surface. They were from the floor to the ceiling in the garage. And I just looked at it. I engaged my metaphorical language, and I said, okay, so you're hoarding information. You can get this on the web. You can go to the library. You can put this in files. Why are you hoarding all this information? He said, I don't know. I just have to. When you hear, I don't know, I just have to, you are talking to someone who is not in present time or part of them. So I said to him, uh, well, where do you feel this in your body? Which is another thing I ask everybody. When you think about this issue, give me a 0 to 10 on intensity. What is the emotion or the emotions? And sometimes you have to prompt them. Are you sad? Are you mad? Are you anxious? Whatever. And where do you feel it in the body? And when you correlate that to the chakra system, whether you use the edit process or you just get a little book on the chakras, they'll, I have not had anybody that could not do this, in, including children and military officers. They will say or their hand will go to their gut, their navel, their throat, their heart, their head, or wherever. And if you understand the correlations and the, um, what those, those chakras represent, um, that's a huge clue as to where you're going with this issue. So he put his hand on his stomach, which is the third chakra, which has to do with anxiety, fear. That's where we feel, that's where we feel it, the gut feeling. So I, I began to like read the energy of what was going on, and I said to him, do you, know, do you have any repetitive dreams? Because what I was seeing in my head, but I didn't want to say it to him because I did not want to admit that this was looking like a past life and I was trying to get out of it actually because I didn't want him to think that I was too weird. But um, what I was seeing was a stockade, a big high you know, fence like you see in Westerns, the fort. So he's, I asked him what type of um, repetitive dreams and he's telling me about, he did, and mentioned the word stockade and he said um, something about colonial America. So long story short, he didn't have the information to prevent an attack by enemy forces that were coming on to, uh, to attack the people that were in this stockade. I don't know if it was settlers or colonial, I don't know what even time or space it was really in in terms of history, but he didn't have the information and everybody died. So here he is in this lifetime storing information, hoarding it and not knowing why he has to do it, he just has to. So we cleared that, and he cleaned out his house. Um, there's another uh, a person who was a physician. He happened to be a neonatologist, the tiny babies. And he had a past life where his wife and his baby 
died, uh, the wife died in childbirth because he was off in the war, and she died and the baby died. So here he becomes a physician, and for some unknown reason, he's drawn to neonatology. He doesn't know why. He did, didn't really think about it in school, but he just knows that he wants to be a neonatologist. So what is he doing in his practice? He's saving babies. So sometimes people are drawn to a particular career. A lot of warriors in past lives become cops and um, soldiers in the military. There are archetypes. Archetypes aren't that far out. There's books on archetypes. You know, um, we, if you look at archetypal behavior, it's a it's another layer of influence over someone's decisions or how they um, how they do their their life or how they do the world or their relationships. So sometimes you can look at a diagnosing emotional problems or relationship problems or why somebody keeps getting fired or if they come in and they say, why does this keep happening to me? You're, you're looking at a pattern. So there's two things here. There's traumas, which are individual memories or incidents that happen along a continuum. They could happen one time or they could happen over and over. And then if they happen over and over, that gives birth to patterns. That's the underlying support of a pattern. So if you try to heal a pattern without healing the traumas that supported it and that are still supporting it, you're going to run into trouble because it's not going to go away. So if somebody keeps getting fired, if they keep getting um, attracting abusers, well, what type of energetic signature attracts perpetrators, victims, right? So you look into their past, well, when did you feel helpless and victimized that you couldn't protect yourself and you're attracting bullies or you're getting mugged or whatever is going on? Could be in childhood. Yes. People have PTSD from growing up in a war zone in their home as much as they do from combat. And sometimes you have to bring it up to them because, again, if they're little enough and that's the culture or that's the the um, the religion or whatever that they think that's normal. Many many people have had to clue into that this is trauma. This is not normal. You know, this doesn't go on in every family. Even even incest, strangely enough. Um, so when we're talking about dissociated ego states, we're talking about anything that causes someone to not be, have part of them in present time. And so we talked earlier about the um, adult that throws a tantrum, that's a clue. And the dissociation has to do with being part of them is in present time and part of them is like a videotape that's stuck on pause. And it's, it's putting, I don't know what, I want to like call it infection or it's bringing symptoms from that incident into present time, and it will keep doing that until it is released and, um, and treated. So um, in another workshop, I'll be teaching a little bit more about working with dissociated ego states. But one thing I want to say is I did get some, some regular clinical training in psychology, and even at the time um, when they were teaching about parts work, it never really made sense to me because I'm thinking, where where are you when you're having somebody talk to their inner child? They're they're completely pretty much cut off from their feelings because you can't be in your feelings in your head at the same time. So if the therapist is saying, okay, well let's talk to your inner five year old, you know she had a rough time or whatever. Well, on the spot trying to give you what you ask them to do, and they have to engage their mind and their imagination and start thinking about what happened. So it becomes a cognitive exercise, but the feelings are sometimes not there. So I put a little twist on that in the edit process is where I use the guided imagery and I send them back in present time in a guided imagery to go into the house where they grew up, find the ages or age of themselves, the one we're talking about that's attached to the incident that we're treating, or younger or other parts. Sometimes I'll send them into the house and just say, well, let's look around and see if there's any little ones and tell me who they are. And then I talk to them. I don't let the client talk to them. I say, if, they, if I talk to them, can they hear me? 
and that kind of tunes it in, and I don't think I've only had one ever person say no, and then one person said, yeah, but they don't trust you. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, we can talk about that, you know, we went, and we went there. But I say to the, to the client, if this little part that you've identified that's hiding under the bed or in the basement or wherever the closet, if I talk to them, can they hear me? And then I say, what's the look on their face? I'm asking them to feel what the part is feeling without getting cognitive about it. What's the look on their face? Are they crying? Are they happy? They're bored? Whatever. Whatever they say is fine. And then I say something like, sweetie, I'm so sorry this happened to you. And narrate what the issue is that I already know from the history and from treatment. Ask them at the end, you know, I have this little dialogue and at the end, and usually my client is crying. <laughs> and uh, I will say um, to the client, ask them if they want to come with you to present time. Oh, yeah, they want to come. Do they want to bring anything, a blanket, a toy, you know, yes or no, whatever. And then take them out of the house, go through the tunnel, you know, the imagery, the angels, whatever, bring them into present time. And then the part is then present to continue with healing. So that's the... That's the quick overview of metaphor language, which is medical intuition in manual mode. It is um, a very handy skill to use to listen between the lines when you're with a client, especially somebody that has complex PTSD, which is a term that, that um, Judith Herman came up with in her book, Trauma and Recovery. And I also want to put your attention to another book by one of my colleagues. It's called Heal Yourself with Emotional Freedom Technique by John Freedom. The, one of the reviewers say, this is absolutely the best book I've read on the subject, easy to read, comprehensive in scope, and this book will help a lot of people. This is about the, the tapping with, with your fingertips. And you have a handout um, from the EFT Level 1 class. Heal Yourself with Emotional Freedom Technique by John Freedom. Excellent book. There, in the PTSD section, there's a narrative in there that I submitted about a soldier that I treated um, when I was uh, at Fort Bragg. He was about to be med boarded out. I actually treated about 40 guys, many of whom were going to be med boarded out. And he had 39 months of combat and wasn't sleeping and um, was basically about to decompensate from lack of sleep. And we were able to release his PTSD in one session um, and then clean up a few edges around the edges with um, the second session. But he had repetitive nightmares, flashbacks, and uh, complex PTSD. But he did have a stable childhood, so that's why it was able to go so fast. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. Can we okay. take any questions? Absolutely can. I'm sure they have some. Yes, absolutely. And um, my, um, my, I'm going to go to the other slide, too. Can I go to the other slide? I have uh, a CD here with there's a table of contents is on your screen. It's one CD with all this information on it. The last time I taught this class, it was at a mental hospital here in San Diego. And um, I put a lot of information on there because I, I had 90 minutes. Here we only have 60. So that CD is, is available. And there's also um, some products on my um, website, which is guidedhealing.com. Go to the shop. There's a, um, intuition development a TV show I co-produced for a college that talks about what's on your hard drive and tapping. The, um, the three sessions with the Iraq veteran that witnessed the murder-suicide that was on my website. And there's a bunch of books here uh, using EFT for children, which are very handy whether you're a parent or you're working in a school. So let's do our questions. There's no questions. There's no questions. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. Well, here's somebody, Christine. Is that you? Let me see. Talking. There's something happening here. Is that mm -hmm. my that's, voice? That's your voice. That's my voice. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, if anybody does come up with any questions, you can email them to me. Uh, again, the website is guidedhealing.com, and my email address is eraseptsd mm -hmm. at AOL. Eraseptsd at AOL. So um, I would suggest that to begin to use this, you look at the handout and start to listen not only to yourself as you say 
these words that we all use. For I use back pain a lot because it's so it's so easy to to connect the dots. If you have back pain and it's not from needing a chiropractor or being in a car accident, could it be that you were stabbed in the back and betrayed, or nobody has your back, mm -hmm. or your back is up against the wall, yeah. or you want somebody to back off and get off your back? Yeah. And uh, Susan, we do actually have a question. Okay. Um, they asked if you could repeat the major emotional wound. Mm -hmm. They have abandonment, betrayal, humiliation, rejection, and they're missing one more. Injustice. Injustice. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Abandonment, betrayal, humiliation, injustice, and rejection. Wonderful. Yeah, Thank that, you. That call that came in on the phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know, do we just want to we just want to wrap it up or absolutely we've got, we've got five more minutes. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I skipped over that mm -hmm. I could talk more about. Um, I could give some more examples. I like how they were really helpful. Absolutely. Of, um, of using metaphors. Is there another call coming in on the phone? There is a question. question. Okay. I have a natural propensity to use metaphor with my clients. It is hugely effective. Is there formal training with a certification for this work? Well, I'm going to be getting into offering certification programs for the edit process. It's been it's been evolving for several years, and I finally I think have all the pieces to it. So I'm going to be doing. Um, workshops probably around the country next year in conjunction with the publication of my second book. This book is called, well today, mm -hmm. it's called <laughs> the working title, um, Emotional Detox, True Stories of Ordinary People Who Found Extraordinary Healing. And it's based on the, my practice and the energy psychology techniques. And um, the chapters are selected based on themes that I've written example there's one of the many faces Oh, in an MRI machine. It's not for the reason that we thought. So she had, it's an open MRI even. It's not the closed tube that freaks people out. So she's, she's in there and they're giving her uh, anti-anxiety meds and she's freaking out. They can't even do it. So I told her to come over and I said, what or who does this feeling remind you of? What's the feeling when they go to put you in the machine? And she said, which is a body memory, I feel like there's something on my chest. I feel like I can't breathe. And I'm thinking, okay, she's laying down. There's something on her chest. This sounds like a rape or something. So I said, well, were you ever raped? And she said, well, actually, I haven't thought about this in years, but, and she starts telling me about a date rape at the drive-in in the front seat of the car. And the guy was, that was the root of the problem. So we handled that she was able to go in the, the MRI machine. So the, the other thing that is, um, I don't want to sound like I'm harping on sexual abuse here, but there's so much of it that's metaphorical. Mm -hmm. The dentist, you're laying back, and this man usually is over your face, coming toward you, digging around in your mouth, and people freak out. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, needle, needle phobias. It's penetration. They're, they're, they're just, it's just a shot, but if you have that under, under the radar, your body-mind is going to react beyond reason and out of proportion to the event. That's another way to read the energetic signature of something. Is this beyond reason? Is this way out of proportion? And it, it can go both ways. You know, when I talked earlier about ask clients when you're trying to figure out what's going on under the radar if they have an affinity for or they're drawn to a certain time in history, themes in books and movies, behavior, movie things, whatever, or and they don't know why they're drawn to that, or the the negative, and they're they can't stand it. So either one of those is out of 
balance. So um, people that um, have needle phobias, they can't stand the sight of blood, some of that can just be a feeling of out of control. Maybe they fell and they were bleeding when they were a kid and it's the first time they were ever bleeding and they thought maybe that if you bleed you die and that that imprints and then later on they can't stand the sight of blood. So you kind of have to dig around and sort through by asking them these questions and using your metaphor diagnosis list along with their history and your clinical experience and engage your own intuition. Mm -hmm. And eventually you'll get there. If not, call me and I'll figure it out. Right. <laughs> I can do readings. I, I get their name and their age. When I do a reading on a new client, I get their name and their age and we, we hang up or it doesn't matter where in the world they are. And I write out a detailed page and a half of single spaced information that is a, trauma, a blueprint for what has gone on with them. And then they, later after I give that to them, they give me a trauma, their own recollection of what they remember, of what they correlate those two documents, and it's a very accurate cause and effect of blueprint. We know where we're going when you are using energy psychology because it's like a circuit. You pull a couple of the big fuses and the whole thing will go down. So multiple issues of abuse, multiple issues of being a battered wife, threats to threats to life in combat. We treat one or two of the worst ones and then pretty soon they just go, yeah, I remember that, but I don't care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and I'm talking in generalities. If you've got someone that is suicidal, you know, none of this I mean it applies, but you you know, you need to deal with that in a clinical way. Mm -hmm. But I I have treated people that had suicidal ideation that cleared from uh, trauma. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? No. Okay. And we wanted to thank you, Susan. You're I, welcome. I am just truly in awe. This has been so insightful, and I have really enjoyed this time. So uh, we are going to be seeing Susan again. She is going to be coming out, and I cannot wait to hear you speak again in December. And I, again, will give you more information as soon as I receive it. And if you are uh, getting a, CA, a CE pardon me, credit, you can visit our website, sovhealth.com, and we should have all the information in about 48 to 72 hours. So again, let's thank Susan. That was so insightful, and I just loved the hour. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Of course. If they need anything else, go to my website, guidedhealing.com. Absolutely.